coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn. This is 112BK. On the show today, the story of a Brooklyn mother of three now facing deportation, and a film about a company that helps get people out of immigration detention, but at a cost. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford, joined in the studio by producer Ross Tuttle. Hello, Ross. Hello, Ashley. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be back. Happy to have you back. Saw your piece in Self today about Tess Holliday. It yeah. was awesome. She seems awesome. She was amazing. I really, really, really enjoyed talking with Tess. Um, it was my second cover story this summer, mm. which was you know, a huge deal for me as a writer. But it's also just been really awesome. I got to talk to Janelle Monet, and then I got to talk to Tess Holliday, and those are fantastic women. For people who don't know who Tess Holliday is, can you tell tell us real quick? Absolutely. Tess Holliday is a uh, body positivity activist and plus size model. She is fantastic. I don't know what else to say. She's she started. A what was her hashtag that she started? F your beauty standards right. is her hashtag. Yes. That and was it's pretty good. Pretty good. good. She's got some really amazing tattoos. She does have some amazing tattoos. They're even better up close. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> they're even better up close. I really, really, really loved her tattoos. So that's a little bright moment we can talk about in this show before things get really dark. Um, we're going to be talking about immigration, immigration detention, deportation, but and other depressing news. The Supreme Court, we just learned, upheld the travel ban. It was announced today. Um, and I think a lot of advocates were expecting this. Uh, I think protests are already underway in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time people will see this, they'll have happened in New York City as well. Um, but a, a really uh, depressing decision. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what do New Yorkers need to know about this ruling? To answer that and other questions, we're joined on the phone by Hassan Shafikula, an attorney with the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Thanks for joining us today, Hassan. Thanks for having me. Hassan, can you summarize the Supreme Court decision? Is it as simple as it seems, the travel ban being upheld? Unfortunately, the, the court deferred to the administration altogether, and so mm -hmm. it is as simple as it seems. They said that the third version of the travel ban, the, the one that President Trump issued in September of last year, um, is not unconstitutional, at least according to five members of the court. Mm. Mm. And so, uh, Hassan, who's going to be affected by this, and when will they be affected? Is this going to go—is the travel ban now in effect? Is it now law? So the, the travel ban has actually been in effect um, for several months now. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court refused to enjoin the ban after um, it was promulgated in September of 2017. So it affected originally seven or eight countries. I'll just read through them. Chad, Iran, Libya, North Korea, Syria, Venezuela, Yemen, and Somalia. So six Muslim countries, two that are not predominantly Muslim. Chad actually got off the list in April of this year. They mm did whatever they needed to do to convince the U.S. State Department that folks coming from Chad are not a risk. So the remaining seven countries are still subject to the ban. But the way that it plays out for the countries is different. For some countries, it's all immigrants and non-immigrants are banned. For mm -hmm. others, only certain categories of non-immigrants can come in. And so it's, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge, but they're all affected in some way. Wow. And so what about the people coming from the named countries who have travel plans? What can they do? So if, if I'm coming from a country um, such as, um, let's say, so Syria, mm -hmm. all immigrants and non-immigrants are banned. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if I have relatives here. It doesn't matter if I had a job offer here. Um, for a while, up until October of last year, there was an exemption for certain countries if they had what's called a bona fide relationship with a person or entity in the U.S. Right. So I can show mom is here, I want to be reunited with her, I have a job offer, um, let me come in and, and begin my employment. But on October 18th of last year, that exemption ended for the countries that had been lucky enough to have at least that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm from a country like Syria, um, or some of the others that are just like, absolutely banned, there's no possibility for me mm. until they decide to 
um, lift the ban, I can't come in. So yeah. at, at this point, we've, I mean, this year, I think we've let in maybe 11 Syrian refugees or as of May or something like that. But does this mean zero from here on out? So refugees are in a, are in a category by themselves. There's special mm -hmm. rules for refugees. And so the travel ban itself didn't change rules about refugees, but there was a halt of 120 days on refugees, but that's been over already. Right. So refugee admissions are... are proceeding in a, in a much more limited way than under previous administrations. The total number of refugees is lower. I do want to clarify one thing that I said. Let's say I'm from a country like Syria or North Korea or one of the countries that is, has an absolute ban. There is a possibility of a waiver, mm. and, and this is something that the Supreme Court discussed, and so I think it's worth talking about, that if I can show three things, that denying me entry would cause undue hardship, um, Two, I'm not a danger to anybody. And three, letting me in would be in the public interest, however we define that. Mm -hmm. If I can show those three things, then I can ask for a waiver of the ban and be allowed in notwithstanding the, the ban, whether wow. it's as a tourist, as a non-immigrant, or as a green card holder, mean, meaning on an immigrant visa. It's weird because it sounds like a solution, but then I think about the bureaucracy right, that is, the yeah, that, that is, you know, obviously going to ensue. And, you know, why do I care if somebody can get a waiver if they're in immediate danger, to be perfectly honest? That seems, like, am I wrong in thinking that, that that seems a little, mm, not great? <laughs> well, it's not great. And, and the terms are not defined. What does it mean, undue hardship? Yeah, like um, that just that just seems like a, like a really good way to continue to have a ban and to, to ban these people, people from our country. Can you tell me, what if people who fall under the ban live in the U.S. but are out of the country right now? What does that mean for them? So if they live in the country and they left, Hopefully they came back before either September or October of last year. Mm -hmm. And because they're, depending on your country, which of the seven remaining countries you are, there were, there were dates in September, October that you had to be here physically by oh, right. in order to not be subject to it. Oh. So because all this started in January 27th of last year, my guess and my hope is most people who are affected knew to stay put. If you're here, it's probably not a good idea to travel. Mm -hmm. But let's say I had to go back home. Grandmother was really sick, and I wanted to see her, you know, on her deathbed. And so I went back, assuming that I can come back in on my student visa. And then the September ban came down. Um, maybe I'm not going to be able to come back in. And it may, it may not matter that I have a whole life here. Wow. Um, if I didn't already have permanent residence, a green card, then I don't get to come back. So green card holders are exempt. There's a little category of people who are exempt. But if I am trying to get my green card in the first place, or if I was trying to come in as a tourist or as a worker on one of those non-immigrant visas, that's when I'm going to have a problem. Right. And, a, and a lot of people, uh, Hassan, have dual citizenship. Maybe they have citizenship with one of the banned countries, but may, then citizenship with another country that isn't banned. What about those individuals? So it's a good question. So let's say I'm from Iran, which is one of the countries, but I also have a Canadian passport. So the U.S. will allow me to come into the, to, into the U.S. on my Canadian or whatever other country passport it is. Mm -hmm. They just won't allow me in as a national or citizen of one of the banned countries. And just one other quick thing. I mean, is this the end of the opposition to the ban, or is there anything else that can be done? Is Legal Aid Society doing anything to litigate on behalf of individuals? I mean, at this point, the Supreme Court has spoken. And so once they issue a ruling on the constitutionality of a given matter, that's sort of the end of the road. Um, the only hope would be to ask for a rehearing or to re-argue the case in some way. There were four justices in dissent, and their dissents were great. They were basically saying this was unconstitutional animus, clearly about targeting Muslims. Um, maybe if the constitution of the court, you know, the composition of the court changes, maybe it'd be worth trying mm -hmm. again. But at this point, my sense is if we went back to the court to re-argue this, we'll just lose again. That totally makes sense. Hassan, thank you so much for talking with us today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Coming up, the story of a Brooklyn mother of three facing deportation. Don't go away. Early this month, Brooklyn resident Bera Reyes answered a letter from the U.S. government. 
English isn't her first language, so she had a friend read it, and the friend told her it must be about her pending visa application. She'd applied for a U visa, available to survivors of domestic violence. But when she arrived at the government office, she was detained by immigration enforcement and sent to detention in New Jersey. She'll be there at least until she sees a judge in four to six weeks. She's lived in the United States with no criminal record for six years. And to talk about her situation and the recent pattern of enforcement facing undocumented immigrants in this sanctuary city, we're joined by Renata Pumarol, Deputy Director for the advocacy organization New York Communities for Change. Renata, welcome to 1123. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell me really quickly, when did you first hear about Bera's story? We first heard about Beta's story um, so shortly after she was she was detained. She was mm -hmm. detained in, on on June fifth. Um, I believe I heard about it uh, a few days after. Um, she's a, a member of our group. She's someone who just recently was marching in Sunset Park um, to fight for immigrant rights, um, and you know she had just been detained, and all of a sudden her three girls were were left alone. Mm. Um, so. So we immediately had to, you know, do something for for her girls who were just all of a sudden um, left alone with um, with their main provider gone and, and detained. And why? Can you just tell me? Uh, Bayer's reasons for coming here were obviously mm -hmm. some pretty uh, intense reasoning. So, yeah, right, Beta, um, you know, migrated here uh, from Oaxaca, Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, she came here first to, to work, um, so, you know, like, to, in order to send money uh, back to her daughter, um, she went back to Mexico, and then she, she came back again mm -hmm. um, with, with her daughter, um, Andrea, um, and has been here for six years. Right. Um, but obviously, you know, a single mom who, you know, worked two jobs right. um, to be able to, to provide for, for her daughters. Mm -hmm. um, she also escaped a domestic violence situation within the U.S., correct? Within the U.S. So, um, here in the U.S., she was a victim of domestic violence, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, makes her um, a candidate for a U visa. She was eager to, to get documented in this country and was going through this process, um, which, you know, just is why she eagerly, you know, um, had a friend uh, read her letter, assuming right. that it was for her U visa, and went to to um, to to a one barrack street. Right. Um, and unfortunately, there uh, she was detained. I'm really confused about her being detained because she doesn't have a criminal record. Is that I thought that was supposed to be uh, supposedly the impetus for people being detained at this time as having a criminal record. But, you know, as we have seen, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it hasn't been, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's what they claim. That's what the government wants us to believe, that they're going after MS-13, they're going after right. gang members. Um, right. What they're doing is really criminalizing uh, working people, mm -hmm. um, in this case, criminalizing a mom. Um, as we saw with Pablo Villasencio's case, um, you know, it was just, a, a guy, right. a working guy, working father, delivering a pizza, and he was detained. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're seeing now is just, just any excuse. Just the fact that you're an immigrant, it's, ma it's, it's uh, making you a criminal, right? Yeah, or having you at least be treated like a criminal by having this administration, you, and exactly. particularly by ICE. Um, where are her kids? How old are they? So um, her kids, uh, her oldest kid is 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, she has a, a five-year-old and a four-year-old, I, I believe. Um, and right now they're with uh, with Beta's aunt, mm -hmm. um, who is the only family member she had here. Um, her, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, her 15-year-old girl, um, you know, has to take care of also her two little sisters. Um, so it's a, it's a very um, um, tough situation for them, um, you know, and also because all of a sudden the number one provider, um, financial provider for them is gone, uh, right. right? Beta worked two jobs, morning uh, in the, in, during the day cleaning and at night uh, being a waitress in order to pay for her apartment and for her basic necessities. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, that it's is gone. gone. 
that's gone. How frequent are events like these in what's supposed to be a sanctuary city? I mean, unfortunately, in this administration, far too frequent. Um, you know, as we've, as we know, like just, just also earlier, just the weeks before Beta got detained, uh, Pablo uh, was detained, which was, um, you know, heard all over, all over the news. Um, so it's it's happening frequently, and it's um, it's very concerning. We've been very lucky up until now. Our organization, none of our members had been detained so far. Um, this is our, our first case. We're hoping this is the last, but obviously. In this current administration, we're, we're very afraid that this is a, a trending pattern, unfortunately. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell me more about your organization. So, uh, New York Communities for Change is uh, uh, an advocacy uh, group. Uh, we organize in communities of color, uh, door to door, from the from the ground up. Um, our our members are uh, predominantly uh, immigrants, whether mm -hmm. it's from the Caribbean or from uh, Latin America. And we fight against uh, against economic oppression, against racial oppression. So we work in a number of issues, from you know jobs, from immigration to affordable housing. So can you tell me really quickly what are you hearing from your members about this situation, about Beira's situation? I think it, you know our our members uh, after this happened, unfortunately. Every time, actually, this happens, there's an increase in fear. Mm. Uh, there's an in, there's some hesitation around uh, showing up and protesting. Right. Um, you know, and 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 mind you, our members are, are fighters, right? Like right. our members, you know, even though they they work two, three jobs, they're out there fighting every week, sometimes several times a week, right. um, at protests, standing up for for economic issues, for for justice issues. Um, so whenever we see this case, there's there's a lot of fear right. um, to come out. Um, we. We try to make them safe, of course. Uh, we um, also host uh, Know Your Rights trainings. Uh, we've been hosting Know Your Rights trainings all over the city and Long Island after Trump was elected. Mm -hmm. And we're starting again uh, to remind people what they need to do if, if they encounter ICE, right. but also remember, you know, remembering that they have the right to, to yes. fight and then we need to continue fighting. Yes. What's next for Beira? What's next for Beta is uh, we're waiting, we're working with, with uh, uh, pro bono lawyers to assign her a lawyer. Um, we hear that her court day should be in four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we're encouraging everyone uh, to donate to Beta's fund, uh, and that money will go directly to support uh, her girls during this time where they don't have um, any income and they don't have their, their mom and their main provider. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go to the GoFundMe page, support Beta, and her girls. Mm -hmm. That's B E Y R A. Fantastic. And how do people find out how to be more supportive of your organization if they want to check you guys out? Sure. Um, uh, we need all the help that we can get. Um, you can go to nycommunities.org mm -hmm. to donate or join us or find out more about the work that we do. It's been so great. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Renata. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And if you speak to Beira, give her our best. We will. Thank, Thank you. you. You've probably noticed we've got a bit of a theme today, a sad one. Beto Reyes is stuck in immigration detention awaiting a court date. But others are waiting on the outside. They've signed up with a company that helps post bail and then outfits them with an ankle monitor for which they have to pay $420 a month. Those fees add up after months of waiting for backlog courts to hear their cases. And when they can't make good on the payments, some have said they face threats of renewed detention and deportation. This is the subject of a short film called Libre, premiering at Rooftop Films this weekend and eventually streaming on Field of Vision. We welcome to the show Libre's producer and director, Anna Barson. Thanks for joining us, Anna. Thanks for having me. And I know I said Barsan again, but I feel like we should go with the I, true pronunciation I appreciate of your it. name. I do. Personally. <laughs> so what drew you to this story, Anna? 
Yeah, well, I had been doing some documentation of the immigrant rights movement sort of last year. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually, at that time, a producer for The Laura Flanders Show. Oh, wow. Yep. And um, I had been doing a lot of coverage and had worked uh, documenting the New Sanctuary Coalition, mm -hmm. which is a primarily volunteer organization which helps uh, folks uh, process and fill out their asylum applications, their mm -hmm. I-589 forms. Right. And um, I had been doing a lot of filming there and kind of kept hearing about, I had heard about the government issued ankle monitors before, but then there had been a number of people who had come in wearing um, ankle monitors from a private company, and that private mm -hmm. company ended up being Libre by Nexus, and so I decided to look into it a little bit more. So, did you find it surprising that there was a private company uh, outfitting people with these anklets in exchange for bail? I, I was very surprised. I mean, as someone yeah. who's, you know, not an immigration lawyer or, like, working specifically in the immigration context, like, on a daily basis, mm -hmm. uh, I had no idea that it was happening. And right. so, you know, as I talked to other folks as well who didn't work in the immigration context, pretty much everyone was also very surprised, and mm -hmm. I think that was another reason why, um, you know, I wanted to kind of investigate a little bit more, like, what was actually happening. Was it surprising or, and or, did it trouble you? Because I find that those are two different things, right? There are some things you see and you're like, oh, I didn't know that that's how that worked, and then yeah. there are some things you see that you go, now, wait a minute. Yeah. What exactly is happening here? Yeah, I it it was initially, you know, kind of troubling to me when I heard about it. And I think the immigration system in general is a, a troubling <laughs> a troubling system. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think when I learned more about, you know, how the immigration makes room for a company such as Libre to exist, um, th that was particularly troubling to me because mm -hmm. it really comes back to you know, immigrant bond and mm -hmm. how high immigrant bond is actually set, which right. makes it, for most people in immigrant detention, totally, you know... Insurmountable. Say, to almost insurmountable. It would feel insurmountable, yeah. I would think, in a yeah. lot of cases. Yeah. So what is it about Libra that's like... Because you watch it and it's like some... Like, you automatically feel something's not right here. Something a little bit shady is happening. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, well... I'm trying to think about the what the most kind of straightforward way to present it. I mean, in the film, what we what we sort of do is we use um, kind of commercial and marketing material created by Nexus, mm -hmm. um, which, as you know, a marketing um, kind of strategy, they market the, themselves as a friend of the immigrant community. Right, um, and then we kind of place that a little bit in contrast with the stories that we were actually hearing from folks who were wearing the monitors. Mm -hmm. And for many of the folks that we spoke to, um, their experience um, was... Lacking? Was perhaps lacking. Mm. Yeah, and it, it raised a lot of questions. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. Would there be anything in particular that you feel like you could share? really quickly as far as, like, just an example of what that looks like. In terms of the, what we we're hearing from folks? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, one of the things that we actually uh, mention in the film a little bit, and the lawyer who we interview in the film, her name mm -hmm. is Hallie Ryan. Yes. She's a managing attorney at the Legal Aid Justice Center in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, they've heard similar complaints as well, that folks who enter into contract with Libre by Nexus um, I mean, one of, the, one of the complaints that we've heard is that, I mean, just off the bat, many of the people who enter into contract, their first language is Spanish, mm. um, and that they don't have, you know, an adequate understanding of the contract that they're entering into. Right. Um, is one of, one of the complaints. Another is that, and this is true of folks that we spoke to as well, um, that there was a perceived connection between Libre Urban Excess and ICE. Mm -hmm. So folks, some folks were under the impression that if they didn't pay their monthly payment, oh. that they could be rearrested and detained, oh. um, which the, a private company 
cannot do that. They're not associated with ice. Right. And so that, that's a, quite a large misunderstanding. That's a huge misunderstanding. It's a huge misunderstanding. That is a huge misunderstanding. Now, yeah. the film is based in part in New York. Mm -hmm. Did you meet a lot of people who you didn't film who were dealing with this? Because I always wonder about that, especially in documentary, you know, yeah. like, how many people are you actually encountering and yeah. like hearing these stories from yeah. versus the amount of people that we actually get to see on screen? Yeah, we we did talk to a lot of people that we didn't include on screen. And, you know, one of the reasons also is because not everybody wants to appear right. on camera because they're obviously, obviously like in very vulnerable and and often dangerous like situations. Mm -hmm. So they don't feel comfortable uh, speaking out publicly. Which is understandable. But how does a company like this get contracts from the government or not contracts because they're I think you said right. earlier that they don't actually contract with the government that it, that's not how they're like a middleman it, situation exactly so right so they do not have contracts with the government they're a private company right and I, I think there's also some confusion that comes in as well because the government has an alternatives to detention program mm. in which they use ankle monitors. Right. So they'll release someone from detention uh, with an ankle monitor. Mm -hmm. The difference is that those folks, to my understanding, they don't have to pay for the government right. issued ankle monitors. So, so wow, okay. Yeah. That adds a little something extra. Yeah. Um, it was just reported today that the zero tolerance policy at the border is over, and the so-called catch and release policy left over from the Obama administration is going to come back into play, except with ankle bracelets. Um, do you think Libre by Nexus is going to jump in here, or do you think the government has other plans? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly in terms of the government policy, but I right. know that just the general administration's policy of, you know, detaining kind of as many people as possible, mm -hmm. which makes our detention centers, you know, completely overcrowded. Mm. And, you know, more and more people are just completely desperate to get out of detention. Right. Certainly that, that um, kind of anti-immigrant, and also, like, racist, xenophobic rhetoric coming from our government right. um, and overcrowding our detention centers pushes more folks to find alternatives to get out of detention. Well, how could it not? Uh, desperate people do desperate things, and we are creating a lot of desperate people, I think, in this country right now, and particularly in this system. Um, how can people see the film? Because it's important. It's, you know, a lot of the questions that they might have listening to us right now, they're all answered right in there, I, I, I feel like, so. Yeah. So, in order to see the film, it mm -hmm. will be on Field of Vision in July. Right. And then this weekend, we'll actually be screening at Rooftop Film Festival on Saturday, June 30th. Mm -hmm. And I believe the screening starts at 9 p.m. and it's part mm -hmm. of the New York Nonfiction Program. So, it's like a lot of different short films. Is together. that the premiere? Uh, yes, it is. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. That is huge. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. you so much for being here. Sure. Anna. Appreciate it. And that's the show for today. Tomorrow, Jarrett Murphy from City Limits will be back with a post-primary wrap-up, plus a conversation with a local artist whose work now adorns brick house walls. Hope to see you then. Mm -hmm.